we move to the last talk of the session, which is called uh, Indistinguishable uh, Proofs of Work or Knowledge by uh, Fontaine ba Baldinti, Agelos Kevias, Thomas Zacharias, and Bin Chan Zhang. And the talk is given by uh, Thomas Zacharias. Hello. Um, I will begin my talk with uh, some motivation. So let me get this hand up of, out of my owl. OK. So the first time that we ran to discuss about this concept uh, was by a simple observation uh, in standard proof of knowledge protocol. So just to remind you, a, a proof of knowledge is an interactive proof where a prover convinces the verifier of the validity of some statement. And uh, this is done in a way such that honest proofs are always, uh, always verify. This is the completeness property. And if a, a prover manages to convince us with some probability, then we actually have a mechanism to extract the witness. And in most interesting constructions, this is done in a prover privacy manner. You can hide the code of the prover, uh, either via zero knowledge or some relaxation like witness inguishability or some other variant. Uh, a very and prominent example is uh, the Snor identification scheme, which is essentially a proof of knowledge of a discrete logarithm. It runs in three moves called the commitment A, the challenge C, and the response R. And uh, it is what we call a sigma protocol, which means it's an interactive proof in a public coin, three moves, at achieves special soundness. It's a strong proof of knowledge property. And zero no, uh, sorry, soundness, uh, proof of knowledge property, and zero knowledge against uh, honest verifier. So what we were thinking is that, okay, we are convinced that we actually the prover knows the witness, but how did the prover manage to do that? So what was the way? Did it actually happen to do this efficiently because it had some a priori knowledge, the witness, or did it actually spend some super polynomial effort to solve this specific challenge. OK, so we're, we're starting to, to see it more generally, because this is a very special case. Actually, the knowledge challenge and the work challenge are exactly the same. But assume that you want to be convinced that a prover either can solve a problem or it knows something. And where could this be useful? And we run into the seminal paper from work an hour uh, in, uh, for proof of work. It was called as pricing functions then. And it was a proposition of how you could have a reducing spam mechanism via these um, tools. So we have a mail receiver Bob, a mail sender Alice, and a, a mail server. And we want to have a reduced spam in this mechanism. So what we do is that if Alice is an actual valid contact, then it proves some uh, knowledge that it is a uh, uh, it runs a proof of knowledge in order to run uh, a proof of that it's a contact. And if someone is not, like if, for example, then the system somehow forces the non-contact to uh, run some for some time or spend some computational results so, so, so to be approved. So in this sense, someone who is actually a spam and is not a contact will be discouraged from such an attempt. The problem with this is that there is some leakage in privacy here because for this to happen with a, a DN92 approach, the mail server gets to know Bob's contacts. And, and a very nice idea of how we could advance this uh, technique is how you can do that so that the privacy of the contacts is preserved, so that this is not leaked. So you would use a tool that the senders can prove that either they know something that relates them to the receiver, or they have spent some amount of resources. And this is done in a way that is privacy preserving, which means that the prover's mode, what the prover chose in order to follow and prove, remains unknown. And now I will just tell you that what we define and model as proof of work is via the concept of cryptographic puzzles, where in this sense, a verifier challenges the prover with a puzzle, the prover returns a solution. And if the verifier accepts, accepts, then this means that he's somehow certain that the prover has uh, spent an amount of work given that we believe that this problem is somehow hard. And all that somehow came to mind and uh, 
brought us to this concept that we will call as proofs of work or knowledge, now for brevity, poor works, where you prove that either you know a witness to a statement or you perform some work, and you do it in an indistinguishable manner. So in more detail, our contributions are, uh, first, that we define formally what is a cryptographic puzzle system, and then use this notion to define poor works that are now defined with respect to some language in NP and a fixed puzzle system. We will provide an efficient three-move power construction and instantiate our puzzle systems with two different ways. One, we use a random oracle way, and one, we rely on complexity assumptions. And finally, in order to provide some intuition why this specific new class is uh, uh, somehow useful, we have uh, two real-world applications. First, how you actually said before, reduce spam in a privacy-preserving manner and how you could build like a hybrid cryptocurrency system with enhanced liveness. And we also provide a theoretical application where you get a three-round concurrent simulatable argument of knowledge, which is a uh, definition from process work. So to begin with, cryptographic puzzles. So the, what we see as a cryptographic puzzle in an informal way is that it's something that you can sample the puzzles and generate them in a fast way, and you can verify them in a fast way but must be hard to solve. Maybe not intractable, but certainly it will have some parameterized hardness. And we will also ask that the puzzles are what we say amortization resistant. This means that if you take a batch of puzzles, doesn't provide you with some significant advantage with respect to trying to solve them one by one. And for our constructions, we require uh, a special property that we actually prove in our instantiations that the puzzles to be dense. What we mean by dense is that if you somehow sample randomly from the length of the puzzle space encoding, then it is with high probability you're going to run into a puzzle. And when, what we, when we mean by proof of work, we don't actually uh, restrict parallelizability because we're not talking about a speci specific time here. We're talking about what we generally can be seen as computational resources. So now a puzzle system in a more formal approach starts with three standard algorithms, which is a sampler, takes a hardness parameter H, and that puts a puzzle. And there is a solver algorithm that takes the parameter of the puzzle and will output a solution. And there is a verifier that will actually have the parameter, take a pair of uh, puzzle and solution, and will check if the solution is valid. A dense puzzle, also, we require to have an extra algorithm that we call sample solve, sample solutions, which means it doesn't actually only uh, put a puzzle, but a pair of puzzles and solution. Our properties are, first, the easy stuff is that the completeness of the sampler and the correctness of the sample solve uh, should uh, actually happen with the programming probability. It should be efficiently sampleable. What I want to stick a bit more is what we define by hardness. So we define hardness with respect to some scaling function which means that if I give the, uh, the, provide the adversary with a puzzle, then, and he returns with a solution, the probability that he managed to do that in a time scaled by G with respect to the solver that we have is negligible. And uh, let me tell you what I mean. Assume, for example, that our solver is, is uh, an algorithm that runs some brute force search in two to the lambda steps, lambda the security parameter. So the best thing that we could hope for is that G is actually the linear function. So we don't have any scaling with respect to that. But this is um, not what something I would expect. So what we would expect is that someone who runs a brute force search, if it, if it does square to the two lambda steps, the probability that he actually finds a solution is, will be negligible. So here, g would be the square root function. Generally, j, g is sublinear. And uh, for uh, the density we will, uh, and the privacy that we will require in our proofs, we want that the sampling uh, uh, distribution of the two sampling algorithms is indistinguishable, and we define amortization resistance with respect to a parameter k, which is the number of the puzzles that you give us a batch, and this, a scaling function, which of course depends on how many uh, puzzles you, you see, you, you provide. So this actually tells us this definition in an informal way that if I provide k puzzle, you don't have an advantage more than a scale of a t with respect to solving one by one. For example, it could be that one puzzle takes two to the lambda steps, and k puzzles take no more than one over kappa to the lambda steps. So 
if k is polynomial, again, you're, you're still hard. Given a formal definition of puzzles will actually enable us to, sh to prove, to show formally what is a poor work. So a poor work is an interactive proof, a proof and a verifier, and it is F sound if it satisfies the following properties. First, the completeness property, which means that an interaction either with the prover running on the knowledge mode, this is, it has a witness, or by having the code of the solver, then this could be accepted, uh, with should be accepted with overwhelming probability for valid statements. And actually, I'm sorry for this, this RL that pops up there. It's not right or left. It's actually witness relation. I have some compiling errors. Whenever I do save and export, it always gets me that. So, or well, something new. I mean, it's like, so it's like the suitcase problem. You have to put many suit things in a suitcase, and you, you squeeze, and something new pops out every time. So this is what happened. And then I said, OK, I cannot deal anymore with that. So when you see right and left, it's the witness relation for L. Um, OK. So and now soundness is uh, defined with respect to, uh, again, a scaling function f, which means that over the coins of the sampling algorithm, if a prover manages to, uh, to persuade us within a, sti in a time which is scaled uh, by f with respect to the time of the solver, then it actually did that because it knows something. It didn't work, it knows. So we can extract it via, uh, via an extractor. This is F soundness. And its usability says us that the view of the verifier, um, it is indistinguishable even uh, whatever the mode of the prover is. Is it the knowledge or the uh, work mode? And this property directly implies the standard witness distinguishability because every witness, inter every interaction with some witness is um, indistinguishable with a reference point, which is the work mode. Okay, so now the construction, first to give some intuition of how, why this notion makes sense, so you can have a trivial four-round construction by having the verifier sending a puzzle and the prover will either commit and provide a zero knowledge of, uh, knowledge of the witness or it can commit to a solution and provide a zero knowledge proof that uh, send a solution. So this can be done in four rounds. It is much more interesting to do it in three rounds. So we actually have a compiler uh, which in, uh, takes a three-round special sound HVZK protocol and a fixed puzzle system and thus produce a three-round poor work. Just to remind you what a three-move special sound HVZK is, so it is a, a protocol with respect to someone in language the prover runs again in a commitment A, challenge C, and uh, response R rounds, and will uh, prove the validity of the statement with a completeness property, completeness property, the special soundness property, which means proof of knowledge in the sense that I have an extractor that if I provide the extractor with um, two accepting transcripts, then we can extract a weakness, and we have the zero knowledge against an honest verifier. So how would uh, this construction work? Uh, have in mind that because we want the distinguishability, the two modes swap should appear similar. So you see that the flow here. What is done is that uh, the prover starts with running the first move of the underlying HBCK protocol. It produces a commitment A prime. It sends it to the verifier. The verifier will send a challenge. And now what will happen is the, and now that's where density comes up. So the prover will sample a puzzle and solution and will set as the challenge of the underlying protocol as the XOR of the, the verifier's challenge and the sample puzzle and will run the third move of the underlying protocol given this C prime. And it will output, so the third move of the poor work is the C prime, the R prime, and the pair of puzzle and solution. The verifier will run the following checks. First, that its challenge is actually an XOR of C prime and pass, and the, the transcript of the underlying protocol verifies, and of course that solution is accepting. Now we have to go to an proof of work mode that looks the same for indiscussability reasons. So in this case, we use the simulator that is given by the HVZK property of the underlying protocol. It simulates a valid transcript and sends A prime to the verifier. The verifier will again uh, respond with C, but what is going to change now is that now the prover does not the witness, it has to work. And how it will work 
it will rock, it work by uh, computing a puzzle that it is the XOR of the given challenge and the simulated one, and now because this is uniform and density happens, this must be a puzzle. Okay, and that's why we need dense. Um, so what, given this puzzle, it will uh, run the solving algorithm, it will output a solution, will send it to the verifier, and the verifier will actually uh, run the same checks. And what is the security that we get here? So given some reasonable assumptions that it's very easy to, to get, if for ex I mean, we require that challenge and puzzle sampling distributions are very close, this can happen for every distribution which is close to uniform, and that solve is actually the, the slowest algorithm of the ones involved. So what we get is that for this language and of the underlying protocol and the puzzle system that we fix, then if the puzzle is G-hard, we get a poor work which has constant of the, with respect to G-soundness and statistical indiscussability. Uh, so what remains now is that, okay, we have our uh, uh, three round special soundness VCK protocols, and in order to plug something to our compiler, we need to have the dense puzzles. So let's build some of them. Uh, we provide two constructions. One is based on random oracles, and one is based on complexity assumptions. So the first one is actually the first that would come to mind. So what can I think of a puzzle? Let's just think that I have a hash function, and I will require that this, uh, I, will, I will give um, actually uh, the as puzzle, the last, uh, I have a hardness parameter h, I will give as puzzle, okay, uh, give me uh, the last h, uh, h bits of, uh, so lsb h means the last h bits of a randomly picked x. So I will give you, th you this as a puzzle, the solution here is x, and now you are going to start running the hash until you find something valid, and of course the verifier will check whether the solution is actually uh, if, you has the so, uh, if you have the solution, take the H bits, it's actually the, the challenge puzzle. So it's something which is the first thing that will maybe will come to mind. And what it, it buys us is that for some meaningful parameters, like H, the hardest parameter lies between the square root of the, uh, the square log of the security parameter and L over 4, and for some constant C which is greater than 2, and some quite big K, we get that in the random oracle model, this has a C root soundness, that's the scaling we get for every C beta greater than a two, and it's actually amortization resistance with respect to the identity function, that's what this ID, so we don't actually have any loss there, whenever the batch of puzzle is no more than K. A more interesting construction is how to go to the complexity assumption setting. So here, we are going to build our uh, construction uh, based on uh, the hardness of uh, uh, one-way related primitives and uh, discrete log. So we, we construct, uh, so we start with a uni uh, universal one-way hash function. This is a hard, uh, universal one-way hash function. This is a one-way hash function with, uh, with a specific property that you can actually, uh, an adversary cannot actually plug into uh, two inputs that have the same evaluation. So this is target collision resistance, and we build an extractor that has a similar property. And this can be seen of, as independent interest, of independent interest. And now, given that we have this PCR strong extractor and some arbitrary one-way function, we get that this function, don't get, we don't have to get into details, but this function is actually a dense way and one-way function. What we mean by dense is that it is uh, output, it's close to uniform. Not only it's one way, but it's somehow very beautifully distributed in the range. And now that we have all the, all the tools, what we do is we somehow instantiate this F with a well-known one-way function, so we get the inverse of the log, and our puzzle is actually this one-way function and uh, some uh, parameters, that, uh, some randomness which is used for uh, refreshing the, the puzzle, and the solution is required to have a, the length of the hardest parameter. So again, what we have is that, I'm not going to go into so much details here, so the parameters regarding security of these constructions are similar with the previous one, but now we assume some reasonable hardness assumptions for the extractor and the discrete logarithm, and just to, rem to tell you that for these specific parameters, this hardness of the log holds in the generic group model. 
You can take another assumption if you like, but we just, I just provide this on an instantiation because this is actually what SOOP's results tell us. And uh, I will uh, continue with the sum applications, which is actually the last part of our contribution to show why this um, complexity class makes sense. So our first application coming back to the intro is now that we can use directly a POG work, not a completely directly, but quite easily, and have what we liked in the first place, that we have our using spam mechanism that the prover does not actually reveal its mode of proving, so it is a privacy preserving reducing spam. Another interesting maybe application is how we could ha build a cryptocurrency that has robustness, has enhanced liveness property, and how could this happen is that most blockchains use a decentralized public ledger that runs proof of work, okay? There has been some uh, counter arguments against this uh, overwhelming use of resources that is expanding. So there are some uh, new constructions that uh, are based in signatures which can be seen as proof of knowledge of some secret key that you hold some income. Uh, so what if we could build a hybrid case? What do we mean by a hybrid case? Assuming that you have uh, a system that runs normally via standard proof of work method, but something happens and uh, most of the miners go offline. We would like somehow to the ledger to remain live here, to present this liveness property of the blockchain. So we could have something like a trapdoor, like a backup, which could be a priority, a trusted party that could use the proof of knowledge mode and issue, and issue blocks in case of such an emergency and then again go out if this emergency uh, doesn't hold anymore and revert back to the uh, proof of work setting. It's, this doesn't mean that this is not essentially the, uh, a decentralized proof of work ap approach. It means that it is like a proof of work with a backup in order to enhance liveness. We can discuss whether it be, if this is interesting, but you can do that with a, a poll work and you can do that in a way that you can hide whether this emergency happened and so you can hide every possible impact that could happen to the economy if they somehow knew that blocks are being issued because the miners are down. So this is not revealed. And the final application, uh, we use PASS as a result and to show that, uh, so uh, PASS has, uh, PASS as a result have some very interesting notions of um, simulatability, like an general, uh, an, a general, a somehow meaningful relaxation of uh, zero knowledge. And we show that uh, under reasonable assumptions about what could be the hardness of our puzzle, actually every hard puzzle should uh, satisfy them, then our, our power construction is a straight line simulatable uh, protocol. And since this is a closed under polynomial class, this uh, lambda to the polygon log L time, then we plug in the results of pass and we get a three round concurrently simulatable argument of knowledge, uh, which actually um, reduces by one the four round construction for the same primitives that a uh, original pass uh, had in their paper. And some conclusions on future work. So as we said, we defined poor works. We did it via defining puzzle systems and had instantiation and constructions and we provide some applications. And some interesting future directions that we can think of is why not having some alternative power constructions? Why not seeing the relations uh, of this new uh, notion with the other known complexity classes? Some more applications in the real world would that actually give more boost of why it's nice to use such a primitive and new puzzle system associations that could plug in so that we have a, a flexibility of, on, of which is the setup setting that we could plug in our hardness arguments. And that will be the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Is there any question? You're to run a searchable encryption, you mean? And uh, what would be the, the proof of work method? So the, the reduce mechanism? Uh, 
I don't have um, actually a direct answer. I'm not saying that it cannot be done by that. I cannot have my set up the efficiency here. I'm not saying that it cannot be in another way. Maybe you can plug in social encryption and work, but this is, um, and this is somehow more straightforward, uh, like it was like the natural extension. So you can use proof of work with it and uh, um, prevent spam. Uh, so it's a way to do it. Okay, that's, it sounded, sounded meaningful. And in the seminal web, uh, paper of proof of work, this was the main motivation. Use this to prevent people that are not actually belong your, in your, likely uh, to be your family, whatever that means, so that you prevent them from doing stuff. And uh, now let's do that. Why let's extend this nice motivation that actually was the in initiative for doing all this proof of work modeling stuff uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper. So let's try to do that in privacy preserving manner. Uh, whether it is faster to do it with searchable encryption as in a symmetric setting, I don't know if it makes sense because I know that searchable and symmetric encryption is fast, but I don't know in a public setting if it, is, it would be more efficient than what we do now. But again, I don't have a direct answer. I have to check about this. Okay, let's thank uh, Thomas again and uh, all the speakers of the session. Thank you. Ah, no. ah, and I also have to give the most expensive stuff.